The Emirati airline Emirates has a reputation of being one of the best airlines in the world. With their hub in Dubai in the Middle East, the airline can reach every corner of the world, making Dubai the ideal stopover for many travelers propelling Emirates to a global leader in passenger air travel. Despite their reputation, however, they have had one fatal accident. And of course, this depends on how you want to define such a statistic. But on August 3rd, 2016, an Emirates Boeing 777 crashed at Dubai and so far has been the only recorded hull loss of an Emirates plane. In this video, we'll take a closer look at what happened that day. In the 2010s decade, Emirates began streamlining their fleet of aircraft. By the time that 2016 rolled around, Emirates would primarily operate a fleet of Airbus A380 and Boeing 777 aircraft. The 777, like a lot of other planes, has multiple variants. Emirates, being the largest operator of the 777, utilized multiple different variants of the plane. The 300 model of the type is a stretched version of the previous 200 model. The 300 would later go on to be developed further into the 777-300ER, by far the most popular variant of the plane, with over 800 300ERs built so far. The Axon aircraft was involving the more elusive standard 300 model, where only around 60 units were ever constructed. The main difference between the two is that the ER was built for extended range, hence the ER suffix. That plane was also powered by the GE90 engines built by General Electric. The accident plane was instead equipped with engines developed by Rolls-Royce, the Trent 892 engines to be specific. The accident 777-300 was delivered to Emirates in 2003 and had performed over 13,000 flights over its 13 years of operation. The plane's final flight occurring on the morning of August 3, 2016. Emirates Flight 521 from Thiruvananthapuram to Dubai. The flight left the Indian city at 10.36 a.m. local time that day for the roughly three and a half hour flight to the Emirates. The plane was being flown by two pilots. The captain in Emirati was never officially named, but what we do know is that the captain was a man aged 34, had just under 7,500 total flight hours logged and had been employed by Emirates for 15 years by the time of the accident. We know a little bit more about the first officer the 37-year-old first officer Jeremy Webb was Australian. Interestingly, he was actually more experienced than the captain having accumulated just under 8,000 flight hours, although the captain had more hours in the 777. The total number of occupants on board Flight 521 when accounting for passengers, pilots and flight attendants amounted to exactly 300 people. This is a highly interesting case of an aviation incident, as though the accident occurred in Dubai it was what transpired after the plane initially touched down on the runway that is of interest. However, we should back up a bit further than this for more context. The flight was uneventful in its journey to Dubai. There are two runways at Dubai's main airport. Runway 30 left and right, and 12 left and right. The two runways lay in the centre of the airport with the terminals and aprons either side. Emirates Flight 521 was given an approach to runway 12 left on this day. The captain of flight 521 performed a briefing with the first officer around an hour before their expected arrival. In that briefing was a conversation about possible wind shear on approach. With this conversation, they also discussed their go-around procedure. The UAE's meteorological authority had issued wind shear warnings for all approaches into Dubai. There was also a brief conversation about the two pilots' personal experiences with wind shear, the first officer stating that they had last encountered the phenomenon three months prior to the incident. Wind shear, in basic terms, is a significant shift in wind direction over a short distance. As pilots often fly into the wind when landing, the change in wind can affect the handling of an aircraft. It's typically avoided if possible. But modern planes can even come equipped with wind shear alerts on board to give pilots as much time as possible to act in that scenario. The recorded weather information along with the fact that Flight 521 was to land on runway 12 left would suggest that the pilots were landing with a tailwind. The recorded tailwinds were within limits for a safe landing though. 
It was, as you'd expect it to be in Dubai in the summer, extremely hot, just under 49 degrees Celsius, in fact. The differences in the air between the desert and the Persian Gulf contributed to the wind shear around Dubai Airport. Eight minutes before the 777 was to land, there were four other aircraft ahead of Flight 521. Two of these planes had performed go-arounds. The other two, both Emirates 777s, did land on the runway safely. A go-around is exactly what it sounds like. It's an intentional missed approach to attempt another landing. There are many reasons as to why a pilot might want to perform a go-around. These range from the pilot feeling as if the approach is unstable to obstructions on the runway. It may be uncommon to the regular flyer, but the procedure is safe and go-around training is one of the most routine practices in pilot training. The local time was just after 12.30 p.m. Emirates Flight 521 was on its final approach into Dubai. The landing gear was lowered and in configuring their plane for landing, they selected 30 degrees of flaps and also armed the speed brake to automatically deploy on touchdown. For passengers, the speed brake can be easily identified as the flap which protrudes upward from the wing on landing. It disrupts airflow, significantly reducing lift, and is one of the few functions a modern airliner has to slow down on the runway. At 12.36 and 22 seconds, while the plane was passing through just 700 feet, the onboard flight data recorder recorded a significant change in wind direction from a headwind to a tailwind. 18 seconds later, the plane passed through the decision altitude. The captain confirmed to his first officer that they were going in for the landing. The first officer soon mentioned to the captain that the tailwind was now 16 knots coming from behind them at 12.36 and 56 seconds. The captain still had a stable approach at this time. In fact, it would seem as if the final few seconds of the flight were normal as they flew over the runway threshold. Then there was what is typically the final phase of a flight, the touchdown and flaring of the aircraft. The time, according to the flight data recorder, was 12.37 and 5 seconds. The captain pulls back on the control wheel to pitch the nose up as part of the flare maneuver. Now, a lot happens in the following seconds, so we'll try looking at this on a step-by-step -step basis. There was an 11 second period from roughly the start of the flare to the first wheel contact with the runway. The automated altitude callouts were made down to 10 feet over the course of the next four seconds, following the initial flaring. The captain would struggle to put his plane down on the runway as according to the accident report, it took five seconds from the 10 feet callout for the plane to reach a recorded altitude of 7 feet. During this time, the captain pulled slightly on the control wheel as normal in the flare phase, but then pulled back a bit further, pitching the nose from 0.4 degrees to 2.6 degrees. The auto throttle setting had now changed from a speed governing setting to idle, bringing the engines down to their lowest power setting. The time was now 12.37 and 12 seconds. The captain pushed and pulled on the control wheel in a motion that assumedly was supposed to put the plane on the runway. This was followed by a left roll input. The 777 had now passed the aiming point on the runway, now exceeding roughly 480 meters beyond the runway threshold. A 12 knot increase in airspeed occurred, and to quote the accident report on this, the investigation concludes that the 12 knot airspeed increase was due to a horizontal wind shear as the wind shifted from a tailwind to a headwind component. The wind shift most likely occurred as the aircraft was descending below 7 feet, as this was when the commander, captain, first felt the aircraft being affected by the environmental conditions. That last part is interesting of note, as it goes on to mention how the environmental conditions in this case meant the hot air created by the blisteringly hot runaway which was measured to have a recorded ground temperature of 68 degrees Celsius. This hot air then rose from underneath the plane, slowing its descent further. It's important to remember that all of this is happening as the plane is flying along slightly above the runway, in that small window of time from flaring the aircraft to when it should have touched down. We should also make note that the pilots had turned their attention away from their primary flight displays to the view from their windows. This was actually in accordance to how they were trained. The flight crew training manual notes a recommendation to pilots to change, as the accident report puts it, change their visual sighting point 
to the far end of the runaway in order to control the pitch attitude during the flare. All of this culminated in what pilots often call a float. The term speaks for itself. A floaty landing is when a plane lifts up on touchdown, usually unintended. In this case, the float lasted around 10 seconds right before the undercarriage landing gear made contact with the runaway. However, the captain had now made a decision. A decision to go around. The captain felt he just couldn't put the plane on the runaway, even after he tried lowering the nose. The captain would also later mention that they were approaching the end of the touchdown zone, so he thought it to be reasonable to make a go-around and try the landing again. The takeoff go-around or toga switch was pressed. It was supposed to change the autothrottle setting, but it remained in the idle state. The 777 traveled around 500 meters in a time frame of around 6 seconds, with the main undercarriage landing gear on the runaway. Initiating the go-around, the pilots would seek to gain more altitude. The plane would begin another climb at a rate of just over 500 feet per minute. Air traffic control gave the pilots an instruction to climb to an altitude of 4,000 feet. This was considering the engines were still in the idle position. Neither pilot had checked whether thrust was sufficient for a go-around. The flaps were brought in to the 20 degrees position and the nose slightly angled into the air. The landing gear having made contact with the runaway would activate an electrical signal which also caused the speed brake to partially deploy. The first officer confirmed the positive rate of climb and the captain called for the landing gear to be raised, seemingly unaware the plane did not have the energy to climb. Seconds later, at an altitude of just 85 feet above the ground, Emirates Flight 521 would drop. During this fall to the ground, the captain would notice the position of the throttles and then manually push them forward. The 777 soon crashed into the runway, the aft end of the fuselage first. The right engine separated from the wing and the right wing itself had burst into flames. The 777 had spun round to a heading of 250 degrees. The passenger cabin was largely intact following the crash. This contributed greatly to the survivability aspect of the accident. Once the plane came to a rest, the aircraft still had some electrical power, and the captain announced the evacuation over the PA system. Five out of the ten exits on the plane were either blocked or were unable to be used. Most passengers escaped from the aft doors. The passengers themselves would later be criticized as countless videos emerged of passengers inside of the plane trying to retrieve their belongings from the overhead compartments, instead of evacuating as soon as possible as they were instructed. There is a rule in aviation safety, and that rule is that a passenger evacuation should, in theory, take no more than 90 seconds to complete. The evacuation of Emirates Flight 521 took nearly 7 minutes. Roughly two minutes later, the center fuel tank exploded. If you ever find yourself in this situation, you have a responsibility to leave your belongings, follow instructions from flight attendants, and leave when you are told to. You may not have the same window of time as these passengers, and you might not be so lucky. Incredibly, all 300 occupants on board the plane survived, though 32 reported injuries ranging from minor to severe. Fatalities and injuries in this accident can also be found in those who try to get the fire under control. Several firefighters suffered heatstroke and other injuries. One firefighter died in the rescue operation that day, making the case of Emirates Flight 521 the first and currently only fatal accident to occur at Emirates. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there will be another video next weekend. I will actually be taking next week off, but I do have a video prepared ahead of time so you will still get one at the usual time next Saturday. If you enjoy the content and want to support me further, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon. We now have a new tier on the Patreon for those who just want the early access, so you can now support the channel from just £1 per month. If you're interested, the link will be in the pinned comment below. With that said, I'll move on to thanking the patrons for their amazing support. Of course, the Patreon shoutout will be ending from next week due to the list of names getting rather long, but until then, a thank you to the five pound tier patrons, Adventures of Stupid, Alice Lutris, Avery Tioda, Baku82, Balavon, Chilhelm, 
Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmatellas, Jennifer Frakedic, Joey, John Ambrosia, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Len, Leon St. Jennings, Lizzie Wizzy Let's Get Busy, Marie Ennis, MG, Michelle, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, MX Koifish, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Wheatley, Saria Melody, Sir Wuffleton, Travis Olexa, Tristan Kriegsman, and Tyrowin. And a special thanks to the very generous 10 Pontia patrons, Ada Montgomery, Anne Sid, David Dabrowski, Derek Bean, Epsilon, Karma, Maga Seal, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, So FP, The Coconut, Trans Rights Baby, Vapranva, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thank you all so much. And that is it from me this week. I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.